the mainstream marketing tactics require a lot of performance, right? We have to perform almost a caricature of ourselves. We have to be successful Kelly and successful Annie and show up with all the answers and be polished and perfect and white and thin and, you know, all of those things. We have to play a version of ourselves. And as with anything that requires performance, that is exhausting. And certainly we can perform it for a little while, but you can't perform that character all the time. So what I noticed in the nine years I ran a business according to the usual marketing scripts before I sort of had my epiphany and went in a different direction was that I could, I'm a marketing professional, right? I know how to do it. I can map out a marketing strategy. I can map out a, a campaign. And then after two or three months, I would abandon my own plans because I couldn't keep performing that falseness or that thing that wasn't aligned with what I really believed and what I really wanted to do and see in the world. This is Rebel Therapist, a podcast for entrepreneurs who are trained as therapists and who want to level up their businesses, make a bigger impact, feel fulfilled, and be very well paid. I'm your host, Annie Schusler. How do you do feminism in your business? How do you run a thriving, profitable business while living your feminist anti-oppression values? That's the question we're tackling today. Here's one small example of me and my business, and it's about the images of myself that I've put out there. I've had my photos done four times, maybe five if you include the time my wife took a bunch of photos of me because I just really needed some new photos right away. For the first bunch of photo shoots... I was focused on getting quote unquote good photos taken without thinking about it. That meant kind of trying to look quote unquote pretty and also relatable without meaning to, I was asking my photographer to package me the way I'd seen other successful coaches being packaged, feminine, smiling in pink. The last time I got my photos taken, I asked my photographer to co-create something more interesting and less expected. I asked her to help me bring out some more masculine energy to not focus on making me look quote unquote pretty and to play with the images in a more powerful way. We got out boxing gloves. We had me in a flight suit, in blazers, in fedoras, with no attempt to make me look younger than I look. And if you're looking for a great photographer, my photographer's name is Sarah Derrigan. Images are just one place where my feminist values have shown up. It's where we start in my conversation with my guest, Kelly Deals. She's a writer and feminist marketing consultant who works with culture makers. Welcome, Kelly. Thank you so much for being here with me. Thanks for inviting me on, Annie. Absolutely. So you are a writer and a feminist marketing consultant. We had a coffee date a while back and we talked about how we've both kind of changed the images of ourselves that we're using in our work. And I wanted to ask you if you'd share, how have you changed the images that you use of yourself and why? So I think there's three stages to this. So I would say for probably like eight or nine years, I really didn't use images in my business at all. And the reason was... I felt like what I looked like wasn't consistent with how a successful female business person was supposed to show up in the world. Like I felt like I didn't look like the images of of success that we were seeing out in the world, the women in the sheath dresses and the high heels on stage with the flowing hair. Like I just didn't look like that. And so I just didn't put myself out visually. And Later, when I started writing about the female lifestyle and power brand, and I realized that that narrative around what success looks like and what it means to be like an appropriate human in the public space and who is allowed to be visible in our public spaces and who's allowed to have rights and resources and success, when I sort of had that aha that this is about oppression and that it's oppression that's holding me from being visible in the world. Then I started putting pictures out of myself, but I got really forensic about it. And I literally made a, a, a Pinterest board of like all the conventional imagery around business and success. So that would be the 
the woman in the sheath dress on the stage. That would be the woman in the flowing skirt and the bare midriff, you know, in the meadow full of daisies. That would be <laughs> the bendy white woman doing yoga on the beach, you know, and saying, you know, with some sort of meme on uh, superimposed over the sunset. So I. Oh my God, I have another one. Oh, don't tell me. Tell and me. I hope it just came to me. And I hope nobody who actually has this photo is going to feel like called out because it could be anyway. Okay. But I just am picturing like somebody with their laptop on the floor in yoga pants, kind of doing a, um, a stretch while they also type. Yeah. And I think the other one is like the person with perfect teeth looking off camera, holding a glass of wine and laughing uproariously at something that's happening off camera. That's like another sort of, anyways, you can see these like totally conventional stereotypical images of what it looks like. And the person in those images is always thin, white, youngish, femme, you know, able-bodied, all the things, right? So she embodies what privilege looks like in our culture. And then we're sort of trained with those images to leverage that as a form of brand building and success. So those of us who don't fit into that are not going to have a lot of success rocking that kind of imagery or that marketing formula. And those of us who've been excluded from that narrative, what's then our path to success and livelihood? If that's the path that's held out to us and where it's not available to us. So anyways, I got really forensic about it. I made a Pinterest board of like all the conventional images and what women were supposed to look like as entrepreneurs and business people and women in public spaces. And then I made a Pinterest board of images that I thought conveyed sort of strength and intelligence and character and, you know, the ability to lead and sort of made that. And interestingly enough, then I sort of got really clinical about like, how are the, how's the head tilted? You know, how's the body angled at the camera? And so in the, you know, the high femme poses, it's always the body is sort of angled at the camera. So you can't fully see the full size of the woman. And she's always angled to look thinner. You know, a lot of times it's taken slightly above eye level so that again, it's angled down. So she looks smaller and thinner. You know, her head is tilted. She's smiling. She's friendly. Basically, it's always about conveying these narratives around what's appropriate femininity, even as we're trying to marry that with success, you know, entrepreneurship, livelihood. And then when you look at images that are trying to convey strength, power, intelligence, it's someone square looking at the camera, making eye contact. It's about the eyes. It's okay to have wrinkles or grays. You know, this shoulders are always square to the camera. And so when I was looking at this, I was like, this is so interesting. And then I actually Googled how photographers pose, you know, women versus how photographers pose men. And I'm operating in a binary here, but it was really revealing. So again, it's always about how do you convey femininity and warmth? You tilt the head, you don't look directly at the camera, you're, you're always angled at it, you know, it's those things. And so when I looked at that, I was like, okay, and I called my photographer because I decided, okay, now's the time to have after you know, eight, nine years of not having photos, I'm going to have photos, but they're not going to be furthering that narrative around white femininity. I'm not going to try to leverage those things in order to build my brand because what I'm actually just doing is like tightening the noose around our collective necks when I do that, right? I'm reinforcing the very things that I want to dismantle. So I sat down with my photographer. I showed her my two Pinterest boards and it was basically not that and yes, this. So I want to be looking at straight at the camera. I really wanted her to focus on my eyes. I wanted to wear my glasses in some of the photos. And I wanted to think carefully about what I wore. So I chose to wear a black turtleneck because I thought that's part of a lineage of thinkers and nonconformists, right? Like beat poets and intellectuals and painters and feminists. There's lots of photos of them in black turtlenecks. So I'm going to wear that and evoke my you know, metaphorical lineage. I'm going to wear black jeans because that's what I wear every day. I'm going to wear Converse because that's what I wear every day. I'm going to wear this big black necklace that someone gave me that was really precious to me. And it was a gift and a gift of love. And I'm going to wear my horn rim glasses. And yeah, I'm going to wear makeup and yeah, my hair is going to be done, but I'm going to show up as myself. And I'm not going to be trying to look thinner, prettier, 
younger, you know, and more femme. I'm going to look like myself and I'm going to look straight at the camera and I'm going to put pictures of my fat body out into the world unashamedly. And so those are the images that I started putting out probably about three years ago. And then this summer, I got my hair cut. So for 10 years, I've had, you know, long blonde hair halfway down my back. And I cut it off into a faux hawk this summer and dyed it platinum. And I just felt so much like myself. Like it's vivid. It's a fabulous haircut. I feel really amazing about it. And then I went and got some photos some new photos with my short hair. And, you know, I did have some spots of insecurity because I've gained some weight and I don't feel that great about how I'm looking these days because even as I do my work, the world still keeps, you know, inflicting bias and discrimination my way. So, you know, I, I decided to do some aversion therapy and go get the photos and look at them until I loved them, you know, and look at them until I could really see myself. And I put those out into the world and got such a great response. But what I'm trying to do, and there's always an edge, right? It, it can hurt, right, to confront these narratives in which you know that you're not good enough, right? You know that you don't measure up to this thing that's being held out, even as you intellectually know that that narrative is oppressive and wrong, and you shouldn't have to fit into it in order to be afforded basic rights and respect. So there's always the edge, you know, I'm always dancing that edge of like trying to not let it destroy me while I'm trying to destroy it. So I put those photos out there and I feel that the more I do that, the more I'm interrupting those norms that harm us all. I love that, Kelly. And it's interesting, like when you and I connected and I found you on Instagram, the, the images that you and I each saw of each other, like to begin our introduction to each other, were these newer images of both of us that were kind of counter to this archetype that you're, this more damaging archetype you're talking about. And I kind of love that. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. And I feel like we both were really feeling like happy and rooted in who we are. And we could see each other, like see that quality in each other. Yeah. Yeah. And that could have been hidden. That could easily have been hidden. It really could be when we have to perform those narratives. Yes. It's a barrier to intimacy. Yes. So Kelly, what is your core offer right now? What is the thing that you're offering that's bringing the most income into your company? So I lead a community. It's a membership community called We Are the Culture Makers. So uh, people sign up for a year and we walk a, a journey together where I put out weekly content that's meant to be emotional fortification and help you rethink everything we've been trained to be ashamed of and access our sources of power and communicate and be in community with other folks of similar mindsets going through the same journey. So that's my number one thing. And then my number two thing is I offer a feminist copywriting course. And I love, love, love doing that because I'm basically taking apart a lot of our marketing strategies and our even our copywriting strategies and figuring out how to do it non-impressively and how to do it in a way that we flourish without, you know, reinforcing all the things we're trying to take apart. And that's one of the challenges with marketing is all of the things that we're trained in that are standard in marketing are usually quite oppressive and dehumanizing and exploitative and often counter to the very work we're trying to do in the world. So I'm trying to reduce that friction and give us marketing tactics that don't require us to sell out our souls and sell out our political and personal principles. So those are my, you know, two main offerings. I also from time to time do really low cost feminist marketing workshops. Last year I did one a month and now they're a little more sporadic, but they were a hundred dollars, a three hour workshop, and you could work on something in your business from a feminist perspective. Oh, how cool. So in feminist copywriting, I know you've got this certification program and I, when I talk to people about this idea, they often will say like, it's, it's not, it sounds good and it's not going to actually work and maybe that's okay, but it's not going to work. And it's kind of like, it reminds me of switching over to less toxic cleaning solutions and 
the, that concern that, all right, I'll use these, but they're not really going to get things clean. So I'm curious about your personal experience with this in your own marketing. Is there a trade-off that you've noticed? Is there any truth to this idea that you're going to make less sales, you're going to make less money if you're not using these exploitive methods? Well, I can tell you, I tripled my income in a year when I broke up with conventional marketing and embraced feminist marketing. Oh, so, I freaking <laughs> love hearing that. I would say no, <laughs> that there's not truth to that. So, I mean, the element of truth that's there is there are a lot of ways to make money that are really harmful and they work. You know, if you want to make a lot of money, you could go run an organized crime ring or knock over a bank and that would certainly work, but it's not good for our culture and it creates a lot of harm. And I feel like that's also true about our mainstream selling and marketing norms. They create an enormous amount of harm. And yes, they work. But is that the outcome and the world that we're trying to create? So if we're trying to create a different outcome, we're going to have to use different methods. And one of the ways that we do that is like taking a look at our existing marketing tactics and asking, does this facilitate more consent in the world? Does this facilitate more equity and justice in the world? Or is this exploiting and manipulating people and leveraging, you know, obedience, authority, privilege, status, unconscious conditioning, like looking at those things. And it's absolutely possible to build different kinds of formulas that sell your stuff without doing that. And one of the things I wish people knew more is that the... The mainstream marketing tactics require a lot of performance, right? We have to perform almost a caricature of ourself. We have to be successful Kelly and successful Annie and show up with all the answers and be polished and perfect and white and thin and, you know, all of those things. We have to play a version of ourselves. And as with anything that requires performance, that is exhausting. And certainly we can perform it for a little while, but you can't perform that character all the time. So what I noticed in the nine years I ran a business according to the usual marketing scripts before I sort of had my epiphany and went in a different direction was that I could, I'm a marketing professional, right? I know how to do it. I can map out a marketing strategy. I can map out a contain a campaign. And then after two or three months, I would abandon my own plans because I couldn't keep performing that falseness or that thing that wasn't aligned with what I really believed and what I really wanted to do and see in the world. So I always was in this ebb and flow where I would like perform my marketing campaign, run out of gas, retreat, disappear for a couple of months, force myself to go back on it. You know, so it was always stop, start, stop, start, stop, start. And there was always the exhaustion of having to show up as a version of yourself. So it was inherently an exhausting cycle. It's not sustainable. It's not sustainable if you have to perform a version of yourself or if you have to use tactics that rub your soul the wrong way. It's not sustainable. You will never stick to it. So what's important then is to think, what are my actual principles? What are my actual beliefs? And then align all of your marketing tactics with that. That's ease. You can sustain that. That's no friction. You're not working against yourself. You're working with yourself. Beautiful. I mean, I guess if I was going to go back to that analogy with the cleaning solutions, you're not using, you're not using things that are making you sick. Right. Yeah. Right. And when you can feel good about your marketing because you are proud of your tactics, they align with who you are and what you're trying to accomplish in the world, then it's actually really easy to market like fluidly and enthusiastically and often. I never feel bad about sending a newsletter or a marketing email because there was no trick to get people on my list. There's no opt-in. There's a thing like, do you want to get a newsletter? Do you want to hear from me? I'm going to send marketing stuff from time to time. Click yes if you want to join. <laughs> there's, no, there's no free gift. There's no trick. There's no bait and switch. There's a high degree of consent. There's expectation setting that yes, you are going to get marketing. And so I know that everybody who's on that list signed up because they actually want me to send them emails. There's no other reason that they're there. So I feel great about sending emails. Interesting. So do you don't use like if you do a free training or anything like that, you don't then send people follow-up emails from that either? Oh, I do. But I set the the expectation at the beginning when they sign up that this is what's going to happen. And that's part of informed consent. I'm very transparent upfront. 
Beautiful. Yeah. That makes a ton of sense. There's no bait and switch. Right. Yeah. Can you think of something? I mean, that was one thing. Can you think of of something that stands out to you of when you made the switch in your own copywriting of something that you noticed, okay, I've got to change how I've laid this out. I've got to change what I'm saying here. So one of the things was what we talked about already was the imagery. I need to show up differently with imagery. I need to take up space as a fat woman and interrupt these body norms. I need to show up and take up space as a woman in the public space. So I needed to show up with imagery and show up with imagery that didn't reinforce the narratives that I oppose. So that was one thing. The other thing was I needed to stop performing because that was getting in the way of consistency. So show up with and say what I really think. Like, don't play the role. So I started saying political things and putting my feminist analysis out there. And that's why people started following me was for that sort of honest truth and that for that analysis, which I'm really great at. So it, I stopped holding myself back and started putting myself out there more truthfully in the world. I really took a look at all my intakes for my email and looked at what I was saying to get people on the list. And like I said, just was more upfront about, okay, I am going to send you marketing emails. <laughs> and, and is that okay with you? You know, if yes, please sign in. What else did I have to change? Pain. This is the copywriting. This eventually led me to build like a whole framework for copywriting. But the current copywriting and marketing formulas tell us to figure out what pain people are in and then stroke it and agitate it and really like get people into a place where they're feeling a lot of pain about their pain and shame for having it and then hold up the purchase as this magic bullet to get them out of the pain. And so that works again. So does knocking off it over a bank, right? That uh -huh. works, <laughs> but is right. it what we're trying to facilitate? I'm personally trying to facilitate women having the power to make really conscious, deliberate decisions about their lives. So subconsciously triggering someone into a purchase to get out of pain that I was agitating is not consistent with the work I want to do in the world. So I really had to look at our copywriting formulas, which are about pain points and suffering and really agitating those pain points and think, how can I do it differently? And so what I started doing was starting every sales page or any kind of sales copy with a vision with a vision for what we're trying to accomplish and get people into a place of power and shared values. And then when I talk about the problem, I don't use the second person to describe the problem. So I don't say you feel this. I say people with this problem experience this. So we get a little bit of psychological distance from it and we can observe it without being triggered by it. So I call that bearing loving witness. And then when I'm talking about the things that make you feel powerful and capacious and willing to take action and appreciating your own skills and capacities, then I use first person and second person, like I and you and we. But when I'm talking about things that are painful and can trigger people, I use third person. So we get a little bit of psychological distance. So I start with a vision, not pain. And I'm really conscious and deliberate about when I'm using second person and third person. And now a word from our sponsor, me. If you want to create a signature offer to move into the next phase of your business and work in new ways, Create Your Program is the thing I made for you. It's a small group experience with a ton of one-on-one -on -one help from me. One huge benefit of the experience is getting to bond with other entrepreneurs who are as ethical and innovative and open-minded as you are. I don't think it's a good idea to grow your business alone. It takes longer, it's scarier, and it's lonelier. Growing your business in community pulls you forward. It helps you know that your fears and mistakes are normal and okay. And it gives you inspiration and ideas and fuel whenever you need it. Head over to rebeltherapist.me slash create to learn a lot more. I would love to have you in our next small group of rebels. So again, that's rebeltherapist.me slash create. Let's get back to Kelly. So in making these changes, you were also able to grow your business a bunch rather than what people would be afraid of. And do you think that's partly because you then were not exhausted and could show up 
more and more enthusiastically? Or how do you kind of understand that growth? So definitely in my marketing, I was putting more marketing out into the world because I, I could sustain it, because I felt connected to it, because I was proud of it. So it wasn't a chore for me to show up on social media and talk about what I think because it was all real. It wasn't a performance. So yes, definitely that helped me get a whole bunch more attention. Second, I was telling the truth and I was putting language to things that other people had experienced. And so when I did that, when I started talking about the female lifestyle empowerment brand and how damaging that narrative is and how oppressive that tactic and strategy is and how negative it is, then when I started saying that and I gave that thing a name, people were like, I experienced this, I felt this, but I didn't have language for it. So I never knew that it was really a thing. So that was the other thing that helped me get some um, marketing traction in the world. But also the, the tactic inadvertently, the sales tactic I started using where I started with a vision and then I named, I call it naming the villain. I named the actual villain and the villain wasn't my client. And I used um, third person to describe it and, and put a real name to the problem. And I didn't stroke pain points. There is actually research that shows that this is a way in political communications to get people to take action. So by not triggering their pain, that would seem, given our traditional copywriting formulas, it would seem that then my things wouldn't sell or they wouldn't convert as high, but they did because there's actual research saying that if you speak to a common value and then show that there's something concrete getting in the way of that common value and then ask people to call their senator or sign a petition or make a donation, that message, that communication will have a higher conversion than starting with a pain point and agitating people and then asking them to get out of pain and shame by doing something. So there is some research and it was completely inadvertent on my part. I just started doing it because I posed the other method. And then I found that there was research confirming that this method will work, which is consistent with my experience. I have a couple nerdy questions for you about what platforms you're using in these different offers that you've got. So what platforms do you use to give your curriculum to the folks in your programs? And then what kinds of, what platform do you use for things like office hours? So um, I toggle back and forth between a couple of different platforms in different situations. So I've used Namastream, which is a teaching platform funded by two feminist women who specifically refused venture capital so they could grow on their own terms. And that's a great platform, especially for people who usually work in person with people. It's a great platform. I also use SendOwl for things like my workshops. When I do a three-hour workshop and I want to get a recording out to people as quickly as possible, and maybe I want to throw some other resources that way, I use SendOwl for that. I use Zoom. I've been using Zoom probably for four or five years now, and I love that you can record to the cloud and give people links to their recordings and they can download them. I use Zapier a lot, which is like this middle linking kind of software that if your various pieces of your platform don't talk to each other, you can link them with Zapier. So if someone buys something in SendAL, it automatically tags them in my mail platform, which is ConvertKit. And I don't have to do any like downloading of spreadsheets and uploading of spreadsheets and tagging and doing those kinds of manual things. So I love Zapier. So yeah, those are sort of convert kits for mailing, send all and Nama stream for teaching and recordings, Zoom for meeting with people and recording them, Zoom webinars for my bigger things when I have 100 people in the room, and Zapier connecting all the pieces together. Oh, beautiful. Thank you so much. Have you have you learned anything in putting together your offers? like in terms of how you found those different platforms, have you learned anything through mistakes that maybe a listener can skip? Oh my gosh, everything. Because I've trialed and error. I just, I'm self-taught in all of this. Same here, yeah. So many errors. So what are the kinds of errors that I've made? No, I, I guess one of the things I wish that I had known about earlier was Zapier because it really would have saved me so much manual labor, cross-checking different 
spreadsheets against each other and things like that, like that would have saved me a huge amount of time. What else do I wish? What mistakes have I made? Uh, not canceling subscriptions when I meant to. <laughs> That's a big mistake that I've made. And so now once a quarter, I take a look at my credit card or my PayPal account and look at what I've authorized and make decisions about whether or not I'm going to continue using them. And I guess the other mistake that I made, and this isn't like a, a technical mistake, but I didn't start a newsletter until two years after I was in business. Oh, okay. Yeah. That was because I was so intimidated by it mm -hmm. that I thought it was like this really complex, hard thing to do. And I really wish that that was the first thing I had done was start a newsletter. Yes. And did you start with ConvertKit or did you use something no, else? No, I started with Aweber. And the reason I switched, I think three or four years ago, was I was finding it challenging to tag and segment in Aweber. I think they've since done a lot of work refining that, but that's it, why I switched over to ConvertKit at that time. That's why I switched over. I think I used Aweber, then MailChimp, and now I'm with have been with ConvertKit for a long time. Um, and that, yeah, saves me a lot of time. <laughs> and speaking of time, how, if you're willing to share, how do you spend a typical day, including any kind of morning rituals that really help you? So I get up very early. And part of that is natural inclination. And part of that is that I have like a lot of children. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I like to get up before they get up and that's my most energetic time. So I try to do my creative work early in the morning, like from 5am to 7am. And that means like, if I'm going to do any writing, if I'm going to write social media posts, if I'm going to work on my book, that's the time that that's going to happen. So usually I do put one social media, media post out in the morning, like live because I wrote it that morning. I also have a ton of social media that's scheduled that's going out on different channels throughout the day. But if I'm going to write something live, it's going to be done first thing in the morning. So I'll have my coffee. I'll do some thinking about what I want to say what matters to me today. And then I'll write that thing and put it out there. Then I'll probably work on my book or editing something else that I was writing on. You know, then I get up and handle my brood. And um, I work usually until about two or three o'clock in the afternoon. I try to block things out on certain days. So if I'm going to see clients or hold office hours or have classes, I try to do that on like two or three days, like Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and do other things like my books or things like that on a Friday. Or So I just try to chunk things into sort of natural rhythms. I used to hold Fridays for to be my writing day because I wanted to block out an entire day for writing. But by the time I get Friday, I'm exhausted. And I don't ah. have gas in the tank. So I can't write on Fridays. I have to write on Mondays and in the morning when I still have, you know, creative gas. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. It's like we try something with our schedule and we have to see, oh, okay. Once again, that wasn't the right energy for that. Right. That's it, Annie. It's, it's not just about batching and blocking, which is really important. I do a lot of that, but it's also batching and blocking according to like the natural rhythms of your body and your family and like the world. So my children are at school from, you know, nine till two. So that's a, a good chunk of time that I have to work, but I just don't have a whole, whole lot of energy on Thursdays and Fridays. I'm out of gas. So anything creative has to be done early in the day or earlier in the week. What are you excited about? You just mentioned your book. What are you excited about that's coming up in the rest of 2020? 2020. Hmm. It's a bit of a shit show, is it not? It is. <laughs> so what am I looking forward to? I am looking forward to going outdoors when we are again free to do that. Mm. Are you not able to go outdoors these days? Well, we're allowed to go outdoors and I have a yard, so we're outdoors, but you know, we've, I've been home with my kids since March 13th. Yeah, me so, too. Yeah. And honestly, I really like my kids. So yeah. that, part, that <laughs> part has been really, really sweet, but like angst about what is happening to the rest of our human family is, is a thing. Okay. So what am I excited about for 2020? Honestly, for me, I am excited about finishing this book I have an agent, you know, hopefully we will sell it. Hopefully it will get out into the world next year. So that's the thing I'm most excited about. And the thing that 
I am loving, loving deeply is being part of this. We are the culture makers community that I lead my membership program. It is so nourishing, not just to lead it, but to be in community and in solidarity with the people who've chosen to join it. It's really just an extraordinary thing. And I, I love it. It literally feels like a privilege to be part of it. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Kelly. You're so welcome. Thanks for having me on, Annie. You can find out more about Kelly at kellydeals.com. I want to thank Cosmo Palms for editing this podcast and Brienne Rising for taking great care of our guests. Thank you so much for listening. If you want to help me and the podcast, please take a moment and tell your favorite therapist or healer about today's episode and send them a link. I'll see you soon. Well, I'll probably edit this part out, but um, I love um, behavioral economics and like, had, do you ever listen to um, the podcast Hidden Brain? No. Okay. You'll probably love it too. I love that kind of stuff. Oh my God. Yes. I sound like such a dork right now. Um, I'm I'm like that Saturday Night Live character that's saying like, oh my God, that's so cool. But anyway, <laughs> Um. Luckily, I can edit out my dorkiest moment. <laughs> <laughs>